The life that once inhabited this planet never ceases to be weird. All throughout the history of life, there have been incredible forms of organisms that appear to push the limits of our own imaginations and understandings, and arguably some of the most fantastic of these creatures are the Anomalocarids. Dominating the food chains of the Cambrian period, some of these animals were the first true super predators that we know of, preying on almost anything that was unlucky enough to be in their way. The Anomalocarids were absolute giants for their time, approaching lengths of one meter or more, which, although it might not seem particularly large to us now, would have completely dwarfed the other organisms alive at the same time as these predators. Anomalocarids were incredibly strange animals, as their name suggests, and their unusual anatomy and preservation concealed their true identity until almost 100 years after the first fossils were discovered. These initial fossils were described by a paleontologist in the year 1892, but they were not recognised as belonging to an Anomalocarid at the time. Because of the softer structure of the main body of Anomalocarids, these creatures disintegrated very easily after they died, leaving only the harder parts to become fossilised in most cases. This means that their front appendages and mouth are more commonly fossilised than their whole bodies, and so the first part of these animals to be found looked very unusual without the context of the rest of the animal. The fossils examined in 1892 were the preserved remains of the hard front grasping appendages, but the scientists who described them thought they looked like shrimp bodies. He named these strange shrimp Anomalocaris, which means, well, strange shrimp. That explains the name of the video by the way. The next time that fossils of Anomalocaris were described was in 1911, but this time it was a mouth part. Without the context of the complete creature once again, this mouth part looked just as strange as the front appendages, and it was therefore thought to be a new species of jellyfish. It was given the name Peitoia and classified as an ancient jellyfish relative. Then, the body of Anomalocaris, with its mouth attached, was described, but it was interpreted as a sea sponge and given the name Lagania. And then, in 1978, a scientist re-examined this specimen, but decided that it was actually the jellyfish Peitoia on top of the sea sponge Lagania. So, there were now three different species named from parts that all belonged to one animal. This confusing mess finally started to be cleared up in the early 1980s, when a scientist was preparing a specimen by clearing away the surrounding rock. He soon discovered that this specimen showed two of the Anomalocaris shrimp attached to a head that also included the Peitoia jellyfish. Other specimens that were prepared also ended up showing this arrangement, and so the mystery of these creatures' identity was solved. Instead of being several small animals, they were all parts of a much, much bigger super predator. So, once the overall body shape of Anomalocarids had been resolved, this allowed paleontologists to make some interesting discoveries about their more detailed anatomy, and what this means for how they behaved when they once stalked the prehistoric oceans of the Cambrian. Let's look at Anomalocaris in particular, the first Anomalocarid to be named. This animal possessed a very odd looking body plan, with about 11 flexible lobes projecting from the side of its body that enabled it to swim, a large head that supported the frontal appendages and mouth, and a tail fan at the other end of its body. The lobes that projected from Anomalocaris grew in a way so that each one would slope underneath the one behind it, creating the effect of a single flexible wing on each side of the body. These wings would have undulated in a wave-like motion, an unusual looking style of movement. However, a life-sized working model of Anomalocaris was actually made in the 90s, and was able to illustrate how this method of moving through water provided a very effective stability that would not have needed a great deal of brain power to maintain. So, Anomalocarids were good swimmers, and would not have needed complex brains in order to propel themselves or control their stability. This efficient method of locomotion was therefore able to drive the large head of Anomalocaris as it went in search of prey, and Anomalocaris was certainly good at searching. The fossilised remains of this animal's eyes were discovered a few years ago, and they reveal that it would have had extremely good vision. Possessing over 16,000 lenses in its compound eyes, this gave Anomalocaris a very high resolution, and therefore a huge advantage over the other animals animals alive at the time, which would not have had vision anywhere near this good. This level of vision, along with the anatomy of its frontal appendages and mouth part, give us some interesting insights into the lifestyle of these incredible animals. Ever since Anomalocaris's true identity was revealed, it has been assumed that it was a huge carnivore that devoured anything it could get its appendages on. The acute vision it possessed, along with the spines on the appendages and in the mouth part, do indeed support this predatory lifestyle. However, there seems to be one kind of animal that may have been able to escape becoming food for these giants. Trilobites. 
These hard-shelled arthropods that were abundant in the Cambrian seas may have proven to be somewhat of a challenge for anomalocarids to feed on. There is evidence to suggest that trilobites were preyed on by anomalocarids, such as fossil trilobites showing W-shaped bite marks, and large fossilised faeces quite possibly belonging to an anomalocarid that contain fragments of trilobite shells. However, some paleontologists doubt that the soft-bodied anomalocarids would have been capable of breaking into a hard-shelled, mineralised trilobite. However, it's possible that certain species of Anomalocarus could have used the frontal appendages to manipulate a trilobite that had been caught, rapidly flexing its body in order to exploit weaknesses in the exoskeleton. This movement could then have split open the shell of the trilobite and provided access to the soft insides. Whether or not some species of Anomalocarids did prey on hard-shelled organisms such as trilobites, what is certain is that different species were adapted to some very different feeding strategies. Anomalocarus in particular seems to have been well suited to a method of using its long spiked appendages to grasp prey from the sea floor, with some species possibly being capable of targeting hard-shelled creatures, but all of them being very able to prey on the weird soft-bodied animals of the Cambrian such as Hallucigenia and Wiwaxia. But, in contrast, this idea of a deadly super predator capable of ripping apart trilobites is that some kinds of anomalocarids were actually filter feeders, like today's baleen whales. There is an anomalocarid called Tamisiocarus that possessed long, thin spines on its appendage that form a kind of net structure. This net could have been swept through the sea, filtering out plankton and other small organisms that would then be consumed by the anomalocarid. This very different style of feeding just goes to show how diverse and interesting these animals were, and it's pretty incredible to realise that filter feeding had already evolved all those millions of years ago in the Cambrian period. Interestingly, a filter feeding anomalocarid was actually predicted years before this species was discovered to have filter fed. A 2013 book called All Your Yesterdays featured numerous illustrations of speculative behaviour and anatomy of various prehistoric creatures, and one such speculative work was a filter feeding anomalocarid, which had not been discovered at that point. And then, just a year after the book came out, the study that showed Tamisiocarus to be a filter feeder was published. So now we've looked at what these creatures looked like, and how they probably lived. But what, exactly, were they? How do they fit in with the rest of the Tree of Life? Let's start with the small groups, then work our way back through the branches on the tree to figure out exactly what kind of animals these incredible creatures were. Beginning with Anomalocarus itself, the type species of this genus is part of a group known as Anomalocaridids, which itself is a part of the larger group of Anomalocarids. Within Anomalocarids, there are several other groupings that include the rest of the Anomalocarid species. The main ones are the Amplectobaluids, the Cetiocarids, the Herdiids, and, of course, the Anomalocarids. The Amplectobaluids include animals such as Amplectobalua and Lyrarapax. Both creatures are known from fossils found in China, and one of the species of Amplectobalua is also known from the Canadian Burgess Shale. It also seems as though Amplectobalua was perhaps adapted for grasping prey with its appendages, similar to the way that Anomalocarus hunted. The next group, the Cetiocarids, includes the filter-feeding Anomalocarids, and this is the group that the previously mentioned Tamisiocarus belongs to. The long spines on the appendages with smaller spines jutting out from them are the characteristics that define this group, and hint at their filter-feeding behaviour. The name Cetiocarid is itself a reference to the entry in All Your Yesterdays that first put forward the idea of such creatures. The other family are the Herdiids, which includes a wide variety of species. One of these species is Peitoia, which is actually an Anomalocarid. Even though the name was originally used for the jellyfish that was involved in the confusion of fossils that turned out to be the first Anomalocarus. Interestingly, this animal may also have been a filter-feeding Anomalocarid, as it possessed long spines on the appendages similar to those seen in Tamisiocarus. Also included in the Herdiids is the German species Schinderhans, which was a very important discovery since it indicated that Anomalocarids had actually survived for far longer than previously thought. Before this animal was found, Anomalocarids were only known from the Cambrian period, but this species lived during the early Devonian, about 100 million years later than other Anomalocarid species. There's also Herdia, for which the group is named, a fairly unusual looking creature compared to most other Anomalocarids, since it has a large shell structure protruding from its head. It's still unclear what exactly the structure was used for, but it was probably not for defence, as the carapace was hollow. However, it could perhaps have been used to disturb sediment on the seafloor, and dislodge potential prey items that would then be trapped underneath the structure and eaten. So that's the Anomalocarids as a whole, but where does this group fit into the larger evolutionary tree? 
Anomalocarids are a member of a group known as Dinocaridida, which also includes another very weird looking animal called Opabinia. Dinocaridida means terror crab because of the Anomalocarids and Opabinia's overall crustacean appearance, despite them not actually being crustaceans, and also because they would have been absolutely terrifying to the other organisms alive at the time. The Dinocaridids are themselves a part of an even larger group known as the Panarthropods, which is an association of animals that includes the entire arthropod group, as well as the Onychophorans, or velvet worms, and tardigrades, which are more commonly known as water bears. The Panarthropods are obviously a very large group, including many species still alive today, as well as a lot of extinct lineages. This is probably as far back through the tree as we need to go to see where Anomalocarids fit in, as the fact that they are Panarthropods shows us they are closely related to some of the most basal arthropod ancestors. So, to put it as simply as possible, Anomalocarids are stem arthropods, products of a primitive lineage that share a common ancestor with the arthropods. They possess some features that suggest their affinity with this group, but also have characteristics that differentiate them from arthropods, leading paleontologists to place them as stem arthropods. As I've already briefly mentioned, Anomalocarids actually survived for much longer than was previously realised, and did not fall victim to the mass extinction at the end of the Cambrian period. Instead, they made it into much later periods such as the Ordovician and even the Devonian, as is indicated by fossilised Anomalocarids found from these times in Earth's history. This just goes to show how incredible these animals were, and stands as a testament to the success the group had during their time on Earth. I hope this video has been able to give you a clearer idea of what these creatures were, as well as how they lived and evolved. I would encourage you to read even more into these animals if you're interested, as there's a lot of specifics on each species that I didn't cover here, and so much more to discover about this wonderful group of organisms and the time in which they lived. The Anomalocarids are definitely one of my favourite groups of animals that have ever lived, and hopefully I've been able to pass on my fascination with them through this video. Thank you so much for watching, I really hope you enjoyed this and learned something new. If you would like to learn more about our world, its history and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.